Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single podcast and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. Hello and welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Michael Nyberg, Chair of War Studies here at the United States Army War College. Thanks for joining us today. I'm joined today by William Hitchcock, who's a professor at the University of Virginia, author of several books. Uh, The one that I know best is The Bitter Road to Freedom, The Human Cost of Allied Victory in World War II, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And we are today sitting in the brand new Higgins Hotel associated with the World War II Museum in New Orleans, and they have put us in the Normandy Conference Room, which means that we're actually doing this interview underneath a replica of the D-Day invasion map. So I, I wish you could see this. I'll take a picture. Hopefully we can have, uh, have that put up on the website. But uh, what a perfect place to come and talk about Dwight Eisenhower and talk about war of the 20th century. So, Will, thanks very much for joining us here at the War Room. Great to be with you. I want to start, uh, we talked about this a little bit before we uh, hit play, but I want to start with a a, a writing tip that I give to my students, which is that you don't have to write the introduction to your book first. It's okay to sort of figure out what you think you've written and what the book looks like and then see what that will do, what kind of introduction you need. So I want to read to you a couple of sentences that come out of your introduction and I want to ask when you, if you can remember when you wrote them generally in the process and what you were thinking, because I think they're really powerful sentences. So on the second page of your book, you write, I have tried to give voice to those who were on the receiving end of liberation, moving them from the edge of the story to the center. So that's a a way of, uh, you and I would call, um, providing agency. So one of the things that your book is doing is saying, hey, liberation looks great if you're the guy with a camera. It's not so great if you're the poor Frenchman or Belgian so what, what brought you to, two questions I suppose then, what, what brought you to think about liberation in that kind of inverted way? And that sentence in that opening, when did you conceive of an introduction like that? Well, those are great uh, questions and, and big fundamental questions for an author. Um, of course, just on the writing angle, when you, uh, an introduction tends to reflect all the the work and and tries to distill the main takeaways that you want your reader to encounter right at the beginning of the book. So it's often the last thing you do in a way of shaping what the reader is going to encounter. But on the bigger level, um, The Bitter Road to Freedom, which came out in uh, 2008, was fundamentally, and here I'm confiding in in your listeners, was fundamentally an Iraq war book. I started researching and started framing the questions during 2003 uh, when the United States was um, undertaking a major invasion and in fact was undertaking a war of liberation. And at least that was how it was framed in the public discourse. And as a citizen and as a, uh, and as a historian, I, I was worried about that framing. The, the notion that the United States was uh, undertaking a war of liberation, not because I was against the idea of liberation, who could possibly oppose that, but because I had a sense, just an instinct at this point, nothing more, that the word liberation is often used to cover up, um, to, to pretty up uh, the, the ugly realities of war. And I know your listeners will understand that um, what happens on the ground is, uh, is always really difficult and people are going to suffer and die in war. And um, phrases like liberation and, uh, and freedom and liberty are thrown around, but, uh, you know, and they're important to guide uh, what we do overseas, uh, certainly in the Second World War. Um, but I, I wanted to figure out if there was a way to bring in those people who were not combatants, but civilians, and who had been liberated, but understand what they too went through in the process uh, of liberation. It's a, it's a story of incredible tension between this most desired end state, which is freedom from tyranny, which uh, people in France, Belgium, the Netherlands, um, and indeed in Germany itself that I wrote about, of course, desired desperately. Um, But on the other hand, those same people actually had to pay a very high price for their own freedom. So I I was trying to capture that that predicament for people in the middle of of a combat 
zone who, who are participants in some ways, but also passive, but they too pay a price. And that was what I was trying to get at. And one of the things I really love about the, again, the preface is very short, it's five pages or so, but it packs an enormous amount into it. And you, you end the preface by being quite upfront about that, that you began this research in 2003, um, and you, you say Europeans generally viewed these claims, meaning American claims in 2003, with skepticism, and now I know why. That their history of liberation suggested that this was not going to be a positive story. So uh, how did you, so did, did that idea come to you before the historical case? In other words, were you, were you writing this book specifically with one eye to the present, or did the historical case you were working on come to your head first, and then you thought, wait a minute, there's a connection here to what we're seeing now? Yes, I mean, I think this is an important point for, for you know, writers and teachers of history, which is that it's all well and good to come up with a, an argument and then go in search of the evidence. Sometimes that's what we do. But this was a case where, you know, I, 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 felt, there was a, I felt there was a story to be told long before I sat down to write this book. I had, my previous book had been about Europe from the end of World War II up until um, uh, 2000, 2001. And so it had just come out. It was a survey of all of the European story. And it was a relatively positive story about Europe's transition from um, the war years to a period of increasing democracy and, and um, integration and so forth. And, but the first chapter of that book was about the year 1945. And it's a, it was a 25-page chapter, not particularly long, but I encountered all of this material. And I thought to myself, I'd like to come back to this at some point. I'd like to go in deeper to that moment of transition between war and peace. And I think that um, historians, but also political scientists and, and government officials are, you know, are really interested in that problem of how a society moves from total destruction and, and upheaval to rebuilding and to stability and peace. This is a highly applicable you know, moment that we, we, we sort of mine for yeah, lessons. Absolutely. So I, I had in mind, I wanted to come back to it, uh, I didn't know how. I, I sketched out various ideas, like the world in 1945, and I, I do everything, you know, and that, that quickly went by the board. Um, as it should. <laughs> <laughs> right, as it should. That would have been, that would have been uh, a little too much. And so I thought, you know, I'll just start with what I know, which is France. And I thought maybe just the liberation from the U.S. point of view. And then I thought, but wait a minute. It might be interesting to try to do the whole arc of essentially from D-Day, Americans and British, of course, coming back onto the continent and then taking it all the way to the, to the end, not just the end of, of, the, of the war in Europe in, in May 45, but really to the end of the year 1945, so that we could really encounter liberating soldiers, encountering civilians and in different places over the course of that year. And I, you know, again, if I had known how much work it was gonna be and how challenging it would be and, and, and how um, in some ways um, ill-prepared I was to tackle this, <laughs> I probably would have said, no way, just stick with, with France. But I, I did want to get the American soldiers into Germany, which I think was an important um, part of the book because it's such a surprise to discover the Americans are like, hey, these Germans are, they're okay. They're not yeah. so bad. We can be friends with them. What, meanwhile, they're like, these French people are so difficult. We don't like them at all. So all of these yeah. things that I didn't expect to find kept, kept me going and kept me uh, wanting to uncover more material. There's a photograph I used to use when I taught undergraduates at the end of World War II. It's two photographs. One is the great celebrations in Times Square. The other is an elderly French couple walking down a completely deserted street in, I think, Caen, trying to find their house. And to show just the ways that the meanings of 1945 are so different. And you, you pointed out in the book, we talk about it a lot at the War College, the way those narratives continue. So to the Americans, a total war ends with total victory and dancing in New York City. But it's the, the great thing about this book, a total war ends even for the people who win it with nothing, with, with no home, no money, no nothing. Well, I, I was amazed. I spent some time in the local archives in the Normandy area, and that was really helpful because if I had just focused on the U.S. Army materials or even, even the viewpoint of the average GI or, or the Ernie Pyle kind of reporting, um, I would have had one very rich point of view, but I wouldn't have been able to introduce the readers to the people who actually lived in uh, the département of Calvados and Manche and others uh, along that coastline. And for them, that was their home. So their home was, they, you know, they, they, they led a difficult time during the German occupation. But the June 6th liberation, and, and indeed the weeks before the June, June 6th um, landings, is a nightmare of 
destruction and, and, and upheaval. And then the armies come, there's the, there's the horrific fighting in the summer um, of 44, and then off they go. They're gone. They're off to Paris. They're off to, into the Low Countries. They're off into Germany. But Normandy is left behind, a smoking wreck. And uh, you know, thousands of, of, of uh, people killed, tens of thousands injured. Every village and, and city uh, fought over and pulverized. Hundreds of thousands of cattle killed in all of the bombardment. Uh, those all have to be cleared. That's somebody's livelihood. So I just wanted to, you know, it, it's depressing, but it's a really important part of, of what it means to experience a wave of war coming over your community yeah. is to try to be honest and, and, and assess um, what it costs. Mind you, the people of Normandy were thankful then, and today they're enormously thankful. And there is this kind of profound uh, pro-American feeling if you travel to, uh, to, to Normandy, France, and indeed to, to um, uh, parts of the rest of Europe that experienced liberation. There's a, you know, a wonderful outpouring of thanks, but there's also memories. Yeah. I mean, there really are long memories. And your, your, your point in the book is that liberation comes with both of those things. I mean, the, the great contrast I always draw when I bring people to Normandy is Bayeux, this beautiful town that's barely touched. And you'll even see an ATM that will say, welcome to our liberators on it when you go to get your euros. And then, what, 20 miles down the road is the city of Caen, which is just flattened as as much as any city in Europe gets flattened. There's nothing. And it has to be rebuilt in this very strange 1950s architectural style. And what what you did so nicely in the book is describe both of those towns, as well as Lisieux and Saint-Lô and some of these other cities that are just absolutely destroyed. Yeah, it's it's grim, and and I will say that um, you know, in writing a book like this, I I worried uh, a lot about the reader feeling as if I was trying to, in some ways, you know, darken the the the, the idea of liberation, shattering and, the myth. Yeah, yeah, and I I really struggled with that, and I think as 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 scholars, as writers, um, especially you know those of us who are writing about conflict. It is a challenge to tack back and forth between this sense that you know soldiers are giving, are risking their lives to, in many cases, to help others, to advance freedom, to secure democracy, um, and at the same time, terrible things are going to happen, both purposefully and, in some cases, many cases, by accident. But the historian's responsibility is to find a way to include all of that, the range of experience in wartime. Um, or else you wind up with an almost cartoon character-ish kind of, uh, kind of story. And um, it, it isn't particularly easy to strike that balance. I don't know that I got it right every time. I, I know that a lot of my sources um, were so sad that as I was reading them, I thought, God, this is so depressing. I don't know that I, I'm, I'm worried that I'm just going to end up saying war is bad over and over and over again. And that really isn't the point. And that's not what the the subjects in the book wanted to say. They, they wanted to say we suffered, but we're also grateful, and this is the tension of the human condition. Um, so trying to get at that uh, for, for scholars and writers of, of war is a real challenge. We did have a, an essay that we gave to our students about whether it should be the Army or some other institution who's responsible for civil affairs. And the argument in this very academic article was, look, the Army did this beautifully in World War II. The Army can do it again in future wars. And I, I referenced your book and some other research, the, the Eddie Florent Florentin's book on when the Allies bombed France, to say you can paint this as a very, very good story if you want to, but that requires twisting the history in a certain way. So your book, other books, would, would suggest that, that that issue of civil affairs, even if you think you're coming as liberator, that's not an automatic guarantee that that's going to work. Right. No, I think I think that's right. Uh, um, you know, and the, the, there's, a, there's a very large museum in Caen now, um, which is a kind of um, a kind of grab bag of of military history, and and it, it's focused on on the Second World War, but it also has a sort of um, memorials to ongoing conflicts and so forth. And I think it's very different from the way the United States has memorialized the Second mm, World War. Absolutely. And just r reminding yourself, you know, that that where where you are, where you live, what culture you're in, you're going to see these conflicts through through a different um, cultural framework through a different set of memories. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. we, we all get to own uh, and memorialize uh, these conflicts in our own way. But 
um, there isn't just one story of the war, and, and the, the you know the French memorials um, are 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 a little bit more in a minor key, I would say, than some of the American ones. So the book begins with with you know when I was visiting the um, one of the the cemetery, the American cemetery in this case in Luxembourg, and it's you know it's an absolutely beautiful place as these cemeteries are, just impeccable and so beautifully groomed and that gorgeous grass and the, the incredibly moving headstones. And there's a beautiful map, a huge map. It must be 30 feet high, you know, and it, and it summarizes the actions of, of, the, um, of, of, the, of the forces. And it's one way of telling the story. It's definitely one way of telling the story. Here's a narrative, here's a map, and here's a cemetery. And it's all American focused. And in a way, it could be placed anywhere. It's not really particularly relevant to the place that it's sitting. Um, but then, you know, you can go to just down the street and find local um, memorials or, or small shrines or plaques about local suffering or resistance members being killed or whatever. And um, it's important, I think, wherever we are in thinking about conflict and its impact on society to understand that, that, um, that sort of tacking back and forth between combatants, civilians, the foreigners and the locals, um, the success of liberation and the pain of suffering, all of these things are part of the story. And, um, and military the history needs to do a better job, I think, of incorporating that range of voices. And the difference between national memory and local memory. I mean, we're, we're sitting here at the World War II Museum, which is going to be and is now a major focus of national memory of the war. But, you know, the same experience I've had in France crawling around there, every little community has its own memory of what this is and what happened to them. So it's it's... It, you know, as your book points out right in the preface, these memories are really important because yeah. if you think of liberation as our army is coming here to free you and put everything right again, you're going to have one vision in your head of what military force does. If, on the other hand, you think of it the way that you argue in the book, this is going to be messy, complicated, contradictory. Some people are surprisingly not going to want you there. Uh, then you might have gone into Iraq in 2003 with a very different mindset. Yeah, I think local memory versus national memory is a really good point. Um, France is a country that's filled. Every village has a First World War um, memorial, um, and every village suffered uh, the loss of many of its young men. And in some cases, the Second World War is tacked on in some local mm -hmm. memorials, maybe even just a, a, a added as an inscription at the bottom of the First World War memorial. So you, you, you already realize, oh, wait a minute, we're in a... We're in a certain setting here in which the First World War still overshadows public memory of much of everything in the 20th century. So that's already a clue that it's very different from the United States. In the United States, the First World War hardly registers anymore, whereas the Second World War is now overwhelmingly the touchstone um, for our kind of cultural idea and identity of, of war. I've taken French friends to the World War II Memorial in D.C., and they just can't they just can't get their heads around any circumstance in which you would build something like that. So... Because again, to them, this is a story of tragedy. To us, this is a story of, of liberation. And, and well, of in success. France, of course, the Second World War is a highly um, conflicted topic because of the nature of the French experience in, in the war, not just the moment of liberation, but the four years that yeah. preceded it. But this, these are issues that 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 um, that are that are present in the United States. Um, you know, I live in Charlottesville, and Charlottesville right now is a is a is a, a touchstone of conflict over over wartime memory. Um, and that's the United States Civil War, uh, and, and we are we're debating. We're right by Lee's Circle. We're a block from where Lee's statue came down here in New Orleans. Right. right. We're sitting, we're we're sitting, sitting. just a block away from a gigantic tall uh, plinth with no statue with no on the top. no statue on it as a symbol <laughs> of national and local memory. And that, and that was a local decision, as mm -hmm. I understand it, to remove uh, the Lee statue. And in Charlottesville, a local uh, decision was made to remove a Lee statue that was stayed by the state, by state law. Um, so again, localities, states, and nations are arguing about what kind of memories we should have and how we should think about our past. I think as horrible as the events have been in my town of Charlottesville, um, this is actually a highly uh, a productive and stimulating moment for historians mm -hmm. to be engaged in because suddenly everybody cares about our work and suddenly people need the vocabulary that we have about placing things in context. I mean, in my town, Charlottesville, the Lee statue was put up in 1924. Well, what on earth 
was it doing in 19... Why was it important to put up a, an equestrian Lee statue in 1924? Well, historians have good answers to that question. It also speaks to the question of memory of liberation, too, which to many American Southerners, this, this was not an act of liberation when the Northern Army came through. So. You, you bet. Uh, and, and, and indeed, uh, many Northern politicians, as well as uh, military officials, felt that they were delivering the South from itself, delivering the South from its demons, in a as, sense, as liberating. As the American said about Germany, right? We're delivering Germany from the Nazis. Yes. So let, let me, let me, I can see the sand in the hourglass starting to run out here. Uh, I want to ask you a few more questions. Um, did you expect this book to be the success, either commercial or academic, that it became? That is, when you wrote it, did you get the sense this, this was what I wanted to do, this is what I expect from it, or were you in some sense caught by surprise? Well, that's um, a, a, an interesting question. I, I, all I know is that when I finished reading the proofs, you know, I, they came back from the publisher and I sat there with them on my dining room table and I read it from one end to the other all at one sitting and I got to the last page and I thought, oh my goodness, what have I done? <laughs> Which because, every writer has to do, right? <laughs> because it felt... I worried. I really worried that I, was, I wasn't getting the tone right. I didn't want in any way to denigrate the memory of the liberators. I, I just wanted to, to, um, to, to widen our scope. Um, but I, I do think that every, you know, every book lands at a certain time. And if you're lucky, you, you find that your book has landed at a moment when, when people um, are ready to hear what you have to say. And I think that's the most we can hope for. You can't really plan it. I, I think I just... Um, I caught a moment when we were all talking about these issues about uh, what is a war of liberation and and should we should we fight them and if we do fight them how do we fight them and, and at what cost so it, it it was a way of marrying a topic people are interested in namely World War II history with our contemporary moment although I will say it doesn't it doesn't have any reference um, it, it's not a it's not a it isn't a contemporary book it's a it's a historical account there's it's not as if I refight the Iraq War in the book at all. But it just it echoed, it echoed, and I think I think that historians have to embrace that we write in a particular time and a particular political setting, and actually, that can be helpful. It can stimulate questions, yeah. you know. And I think um, embracing the opportunities they present is is worth doing. That's a good way to connect to a wider audience. It's also what I loved in the way you set the book up. We we talk about this a lot in class. That students will sometimes say to me, "Well, give me an objective history of of X." And my answer is that not only do I don't think they exist, I don't think as a profession we value it, right? It's better to sort of say, these are my biases, this is what I'm thinking, this is what I'm arguing, these are the ideas I'm putting out into this kind of marketplace of ideas. But, uh, but I, what I liked about the way you set your book up is the way you did that quite explicitly. Here's where I'm coming from and here's why I'm writing the book. Well, historians, historians, and this is different from, from some writers, but historians are supposed to have an argument. We're supposed to have a, 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 a plan, and, and the book or our article or our term paper is supposed to support a particular point of view that you state right up front. Your thesis statement says, here's what I think is the answer to this question, and here's how I'm going to prove it. So there's a, there's a myth, I think, and it's, a, and it's not a particularly constructive one, that historians are just chroniclers. Essentially, if we just line up our facts in a row, we'll get it right, capital R. No way. That's just not what historians do. We, we are creators. We, 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 we develop ideas. We, we come up with big questions that we want to answer. And we might answer it very differently from 10 other people who would tackle the same question. So being open about your method is important. And we have another responsibility as well, which is to shine light into the places we would sometimes prefer to keep dark. So we would prefer to think of American soldiers going through Europe as always doing the right thing. But, you know, later in the book, you talk about you know, some Americans being very interested in the plight of the Jews and trying to help, but others just showing no concern at all. And that doesn't make them bad people. It's just, it's what you would expect a group of several thousand human beings, you would expect very different responses. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, this is why historians sometimes are popular and sometimes uh, they aren't. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, if you go into a, reading a history with an open mind, what you're looking for is to be surprised. You're looking for things that uh, tell you something that you didn't know. Yeah. Uh, it's not so interesting just to hear the same narrative of events re recounted over and over again. You, you want to see something fresh, something original, and, and that's what we're trying to do as, as scholars and writers um, all the time. It's also the key of getting into the places like the local archives, which is where you're going to find the material to help you build that. So you, you went from this project to uh, the age of Eisenhower. Uh, in some ways, that's a natural 
rotation to go from World War II and Europe and something Eisenhower was leading into sort of the Eisenhower presidency and post post war. Uh, did how how early in this process did you know you wanted to make that transition? Did did this project give you questions about Eisenhower or were these two completely separate ideas? They were pretty separate. Ike is in the book as a kind of distant figure um, in the liberation book, um, of course, as the commander of the, uh, the Allied armies. But I got to the end of it, and I had been doing a certain kind of work, really detailed sort of local histories, um, and it's tiring, it's, it's, it's uh, time-consuming. And quite honestly, it, it, the, it, it's very sprawling. You know, we're moving in, the, in this book um, from, from Normandy all the way up uh, Western Europe into Germany, and then there's even material on Eastern Europe and the, the DPs and the liberated camps and so on. So I needed a different kind of writing, and I think our brains just get tired of doing one kind of work. Yeah. And, I, and my, my, my wife actually suggested a biography because she had written a biography. And I was casting around, talking to colleagues and editors, and uh, I, I, I thought Eisenhower would make an interesting case, but I realized that really he has two lives, the, 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 the life of a commander and the life of a president. And it struck me that his presidential career was much less studied. And scanning the, the literature, it seemed to me there hadn't been a good study of his presidency for many, many years. And so I thought, I'll see what my editor says. And that's, that was the beginning of a great conversation, and, and they were enthusiastic about it. And here again, it's a question of timing. Um, Eisenhower is a mythical creature, a moderate Republican, somebody who was hugely admired at his, in, in his time and was genuinely thought to be of, almost above party. Mm -hmm. And in our polarized era, um, that's a pretty rare thing to be. He almost ran as a Democrat, right? He, mean, he, he, well, he didn't, but well, people thought he could have because yeah. they had no idea where he was on the ideologi ideological spectrum. In fact, he had some very strong um, small-c conservative views about things, but he never talked about that. He wasn't publicly recognized as a politician. So um, that became interesting to me. Like, wh how, did, how did this um, man transitioned from a military career into the political arena, and then what did he do in the political arena that was distinctive and different from our era? Um, what, is, what does it mean to, to, to feel that you're in some ways above party, that you really represent the nation? Mm. That's A genuine head of state. Right. right. That's what he tried to do. In the Obviously, sense, yeah. he made many partisan decisions at times, but yeah. But we, I think, um, as a country, are looking for how to reconnect with that notion of public service that's genuinely outside of a party framework. Um, and so I was intrigued. And I, I, I have to say, the more, more I, time I spent with Eisenhower, the more I liked him, which is a good sign. Initially, I wasn't sure where I was going to capture this guy. You know, he's famously elusive and, and um, you know, sort of Although he talked a lot, wrote a lot, he, he's, his, his inner core is kind of hard to nail down. Um, but I, I really came to appreciate his style as president. Um, and, and, you know, he, he, he was, I argue, were enormously consequential for the country. And uh, somebody I think we should understand his model of presidential leadership better than we do. So we're almost out of time. So usually I like to end this by asking two questions. I don't know if we'll get to both, but what are you reading right now? Well, right now I'm reading a number of books um, that I'm reviewing. Um, I'm reading in Cold War history a lot because I teach in the Cold War. Um, I'm reading a book about uh, Khrushchev's visit to the United States in 1959, um, which is comic gold. I think my mother was there. He came through Pittsburgh. My mother's school let out to go out on the street and wave to him as he, as he came by. I mean, it was a 10-day yeah. trip that just, you know, yeah. blew up the press. It and almost could, couldn't have been any other, it's, right? It's so perfect. It's such a great, it's such a great way of capturing Cold War history, the weirdness of Cold War history. Yeah. Khrushchev comes to the U.S., tours across the country, goes to California, goes to Hollywood, meets Shirley MacLaine on the set of Can Can. I mean, the whole thing is, is quite fun, and it's a, it's a, it's a very nice, short, um, lively account of this important event. And what do you, what's your next project to write? I'm just starting out the research and framing of a, of a book about America's responses to the collapse of democracy in Europe in the late 1930s. So it's not rehashing the same old isolationist stuff as much as it is, I want to know what the internationalists were saying in the 30s and how they were starting to say, what happens in Europe matters to America. We have a responsibility to deal with that. Now, we would get there as a country in 19, late 1940, 
But my hunch is that many Americans were there much earlier. Mm -hmm. They had been watching the Spanish Civil War with anxiety. They had been watching the, the, the rise of, of Hitler and, and, and uh, Mussolini for a long, long time. African Americans, uh, Jewish Americans, women, internationalists of all stripes were writing a lot about this. And I'm going to try to figure out how to tell that story. I think I can see the way your preface is going to go already. So <laughs> There might be some contemporary echoes. <laughs> the sand is running out of the hourglass. Uh, William Hitchcock, I want to thank you very much for joining us. And uh, again, I just can't believe that we're doing it in this room. So we'll try to get someone to get our picture and get that on the web as well. But thank you very much. It was a lot of fun, Mike. Thanks. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.